wherein we run the risk of rushing into the presence of our maker in the very act of offending him. To engage in dueling was to place honor above Christian duty. In sum, dueling was contrary to Wellington's own inclinations, to civil law, and to long established Christian moral teaching. So what was the first minister of a king, who was also head of the Church of England, doing out there in Battersea at 8 a.m. that spring morning? Well, as anyone could have told you, Arthur Wellesley, Knight of the Bath, Baron Doro of Wellington, Viscount Wellington of Talavara and of Wellington, Earl of Wellington, Marquis of Wellington and of Doro, and Duke of Wellington, was defending his honor as a gentleman against the Earl of Winchelsea and of Nottingham. Despite all those names, only two people were involved. <laughs> the conduct of this duel reflected conventions originating in the early 16th century in Italy and codified in documents such as the famous Irish duello or duel code, quote, settled at Clonmel Summer Assizes 1777 by the gentlemen delegates of Tipperary, Galway, Mayo, Sligo, and Roscommon, and prescribed for general adoption throughout Ireland, which was known because it had 26 rules as the 26 commandments. Wellington's challenge, delivered by his second, Sir Henry Harding, the Secretary of War, who was a veteran of the campaigns in the Iberian Peninsula that had made Wellington a national hero, required only the mention of a gentleman's demand for satisfaction in order to be understood. The word duel doesn't occur anywhere in the exchanges between the two of them. Winchelsea's second was the, the Earl of Falmouth. Wellington and Harding arrived first. Harding had sent a coach to fetch Wellington's doctor, Dr. John Robert Hume. When the good doctor arrived, he was astonished to find his patient preparing to shoot and be shot at. In one of the comic opera moments found in many a duel, Winchelsea and Falmouth had first directed their coachman to the wrong place, in Putney. Once they arrived, however, the seconds measured out the 12 yards between their principals, who were given their pistols, and told by Harding, as the challenger second, that they should cock them and be ready to fire when he gave the order. There is some dispute as to exactly what happened when Harding shouted, gentlemen, are you ready, fire. We know that Wellington fired first, and according to his own account, fired wide deliberately. He didn't try to shoot the Earl. But it would have been hard to tell if he was making a good faith effort to shoot the Earl, since dueling pistols were incredibly unreliable. And in any case, though Wellington was a great general, he was famously a very bad shot. <laughs> the, the, the diaries of English women of this period are full of accounts of him shooting everything except um, the game. Uh, game keepers, sure. And <laughs> women, women hanging, drying out of windows in cottages, sure. But uh, occasionally even someone who was with him. He was a sort of Dick Cheney of his day. <laughs> but there's no dispute as to what happened when Wellington fired. Winchelsea pointed his gun, his pistol, in the air over his head and fired a bullet that no one could have supposed was aimed at the Prime Minister. This practice had a name. It was called deloping. It was a gesture of surrender. Now that Winchelsea's somewhat eccentric sense of the proprieties was satisfied, his written expression of contrition, the apology that the Duke had been asking for all along, and which had clearly been drafted before this all began, was produced to Wellington and uh, through the seconds. And Wellington's response was, this won't do. This isn't an apology. And he insisted that they would have to return to firing <laughs> unless the document was amended to include the actual word apology. So Winchelsea and his second Falmouth complied. The word apology was introduced. And Dr. Hume witnessed the revised document, which included the promise on Winchelsea's part to print the text of the apology in the standard in the very pages where he had published the accusation that led to Wellington's challenge in the first place. Then, as Charles Greville reports in his diaries, quote, the Duke touched his hat, said, good morning, my lords, mounted his horse, and rode off. Well, not surprisingly, these events were soon the talk of London. Many people professed themselves shocked that the Prime Minister had taken part in this duel. The Morning Herald observed sententiously, no wonder the multitude break laws when the lawmakers themselves, the great, the powerful, and the famous, set them at open defiance. 
But others wondered at the great man's participation, not so much because it was illegal as because it made him look, well, ridiculous. Despite this mockery, Wellington got the better of the affair. Harding had expressed disgust on Battersea Fields at Winchelsea's refusal to apologize when he was so clearly in the wrong. The sentiment was widely shared. Greville's summary of the response, at least in the circles in which he moved, which meant the court, is straightforward. Nothing could equal the astonishment caused by this event. Everybody, of course, sees the event in a different light. All blame Lord Winchelsea, but they are divided as to whether the Duke ought to have fought or not. But perhaps Greville's most important observation was this rather modern-sounding one, Lord Winchelsea is a maniac. <laughs> in the heady atmosphere of constitutional debate, as popular discontent seethed in England as well as in Ireland, Wellington's conversion to Catholic emancipation had worried many of his conservative fellow citizens. Many aspersions had been cast against him. In picking the eccentric Earl and his ridiculous accusation to stand for his calumniators, Wellington had made a wise choice. But something had changed. A generation earlier, there could have been no doubt that Wellington was doing what he had to do. Few passages of the prose written at the time display more clearly the tension between the culture of honor and the new world that was emerging than Charles Gravel's frank personal evaluation, written, I should point out, for publication only after his own death, which was many years later, but written at the time, uh, his own personal evaluation of Wellington's decision to issue this challenge to Winchelsea. Here's what he says. I think the Duke ought not to have challenged him. It was very juvenile and he stands in too high a position, and his life is so much publica cura, uh, public concern, that he should have treated him and his letter with the contempt they merited. It was a great error in judgment, but certainly a venial one. This is a very confused passage, right? It's a great error in judgment, but it's venial. It's juvenile, but it's impossible not to admire the high spirit, which disdained to shelter itself behind the immunities of his great character and station and the simplicity and almost humility which made him at once descend to the level of Lord Winchelsea, when he might, without subjecting himself to any imputation derogatory to his honor, have assumed a tone of lofty superiority and treated him as unworthy of notice. Still, it was beneath his dignity. I haven't, there's no, this is just the same passage. I haven't taken anything out of it. Still, it was beneath his dignity. It lowered him and was more or less ridiculous. So is Greville committed to the ideology of the duel? The challenge, he says, was juvenile and ridiculous, but the error in making it was venial. In the world of honor, though, making yourself ridiculous, acting beneath your dignity, is the worst possible sin. But Greville's defection from the old culture of the duel shows most in his ignoring the principle that on the field, all gentlemen are equal. Rule 38 of the Royal Code, one of the other duello codes, is clear. The parties have, by the very act of meeting, made an, an acknowledgment of equality. In the world of honor, the equality of gentlemen displayed in the duel declared their shared superiority to the common people. In saying that Wellington lowered himself by attending to someone unworthy of notice, Greville shows he has lost sympathy for this fundamental feature of the culture of the duel. In, the culture of, in that culture, any gentleman nobody could deny that the 10th Earl of Winchelsea and 5th Earl of Nottingham was a gentleman, is worthy of notice. Nor was there any doubt that Winchelsea's accusation was an unwarranted assault on Wellington's character, as the uh, uh, apology he finally issued admitted. So the conclusion is irresistible. Greville judges Wellington's act juvenile by a standard other than the standard of gentlemanly honor that had sustained the practice of the duel.